thank you, Cobus, for a lovely talk. I hope everyone enjoyed it. But now it's my turn to actually maybe practice a bit of some of the things that Cobus told us about. So my interview will have a trajectory, and my questions will provide some constraints. And whether we have any sort of emergence or not, well, you're going to be the judge of that. So there is a, a definite trajectory and pattern here, uh, which you will probably enjoy. So let's follow your discussion of you know, uh, some of your case studies and possible worlds and narratives. So I'd like to start off with a background question. So let's start off with some initial conditions. So um, it's, I've been puzzled by this ever since I met you. And that is uh, something about narrative and your own personal narrative. Uh, could you tell us a little bit about your background? How did you get interested in this? You know, here you are, somebody who is a person in translation studies, and you sit down next to me in Chicago and you start talking to me about nonlinear dynamics, uh, which got my attention immediately. Uh, how, what, what, what were the conditions which allowed you to move from that po the point where you started in translation studies to the point you are now? And if you'd like, you know, maybe you could mention some important figures along the way who influenced you. Well, it was a dark and stormy night. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> There's another narrative for you. No, literally. Um, I, started, I started picking up in reading, started picking this up. But in 2009, my colleague, Yakin Udia, which many of you will know, and I went to Melbourne to the artist conference. And I didn't have money to stay in anything but uh, um, backpackers. And Yaki, being the gracious soul that he is, agreed to share a room with me. Um, he, I mean, he had money to stay in the fancy places, right. but I mean, it, that's just the way he is. And one night, a drunk group, drunken group of young people came in and vomited all over the passage and were um, emotional and loud. And it was drywall, so we could hear everything. And they sat mm -hmm. down against the wall and they started talking. And me and Yaki both being relatively timid people and being in a foreign country, you don't want to make trouble. What do we do? We take out our books, two o'clock at night, and we started reading because we're awake now. Mm -hmm. yeah. And I said something to Yaki about complexity, and he said to me, well, write a book about it. And that's literally on that amidst <laughs> drunkenness and all kinds of things. Contingency at work. <laughs> we can see it right here. Chance factors. Yes. No, but it... Um, I cannot tell you exactly where I picked this up for the first time. Um, it must have been in reading. Um, the people, obviously, Yaki, as a colleague, was, was influential. Right. And then I started, first off, the, the first book that I read about this was The History of the Santa Fe Institute um, by Waldrop. Which I think would be a um, a good entrance. So it's 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 a nicely written history, with some explanations of how the thought came to be, um, and from there on I kept um, reading on this. I actually sort of now have linked this also to semiotics in, mm -hmm. the, in a more broader sense, but still with the, with a complexity background. So yes. Um, Stuart Kaufman wrote some fantastic stuff about, mm -hmm. um, he's a physicist, um, about complexity. Even the one book is called Reinventing the Sacred, mm -hmm. where he explores um, mystery and the mysteriousness of life against compl the, the complexity of physicality. Mm -hmm. um, and Terence Deacon, obviously, was a huge um, influence. His, his work called... Um, incomplete nature mm -hmm. um, and yes um, so I would I would suggest if you start out to to read the Waldrop book and then there are also some interesting uh, more popular books um, I think Levine was one person yeah. who wrote a more popular version um, and you're welcome to to email me I can assist with this okay uh, just before we go on you often reference purse do you think that Peirce actually had some aspects of complexity thinking in his thought? I don't mean to be, you know, sound too wiggish yeah. in, in terms of my interpretation, but... Uh, Look, um, I cannot give you a scholarly answer to that question. Right. Um, my, my own interpretation on the relatively little bit that I, I mean, I'm, I'm not a Peirce scholar, I'm right. trying to understand him. 
is that, yes, in the sense that, well, at least in the sense that he was not absolutely logical in the way in which he presented mm. his stuff. He would contradict himself. Um, he, would, he would sometimes talk about semiosis as a very material, physical thing, and then he would talk about it as a very mental, abstract thing. He would be, some people would say he's a materialist, some say he's a realist, some say he's an idealist, some say he's a nominalist. So I think all those, um, all the contradictions to me suggest that, that at least he had a, a sense of how complex things are, and by the way, I think the, the first ideas on complexity started surfacing in the 1880s, which yeah. would be with, you know, in, in, in his time. Yeah, yes. absolutely. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, absolutely. Let's stay concrete for a moment, and let's also think about narratives. And I'd like to shift to some of you, because you're building your own personal narratives. And I'd like to ask you now, you've laid out this grand scheme for us. Uh, could you tell us, for the, particularly for the people in this room who are educators or are trying to be educators or future translators, what in, is there any practical way in which what you say can uh, influence the education and training of uh, interpreters and translators? Um, it's, I don't think about this a lot. <laughs> yeah. um, so let me be honest about it. So what I would suggest is that at a, at a very practical level, and I'm not the first person to say this, I think Anthony Pym is, is at least, and, and some other people have said it, that a good translator should be able to produce at least two translations hmm. and then choose the most fitting one. Mm -hmm. Well, I would say even maybe three, just to, be, to, 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 to um, bring in the complexity a bit more. But one of the ways I think in, in training, to, to bring this kind of thinking to mind would be to ask one student to produce a number of translations on the mm -hmm. same text mm -hmm. and then think, reflect about why they did it, how mm -hmm. they did it, why is it possible to have done that, mm -hmm. and each time which were the constraints that, right. that guided that particular translation. Right. I mean, you can even, if, if, you, if you want to, you can write little briefs for them, mm -hmm. translate let's say you, you can translate for three different audiences would be a very simple one. Right. Or translate, and, and then you can change the audience or translate for educated people and for uneducated people, something like that. So that, that would be, but, but then there needs to be some kind of refle reflexivity, I think, built in. Um, I think the, the other thing that might help is um, sure, we need to help the students understand that language and meaning um, is, is, is relative and is, is, is not absolute. But I think we also need to help them understand that the conditions under which mm -hmm. we use these things um, equally constrain what we are able mm -hmm. to do. Um, for instance, in interpreting studies, um, your your conference interpreters were basically, I mean, conference interpreting sort of started first. So the principles of conference interpreting tend to be applied to all kinds of situations. Um, and some of the data we work with, let's say, in, um, in refugee camps, in, in um, one of my postdocs are working on this in Somalia, um, the conditions under which you operate there have a total different set of constraints on mm -hmm. what, not only what you can do, but what you should do. Mm -hmm. um, and because you cannot do certain things, you have to play other roles and the, the situation requires other roles. So I think maybe the term is historicity to, to, to help students understand that um, the kind of practices that evolve will each be relatively unique because of the historical conditions under which it's, it's done. Right, right, right. Um, and that, once again, you can do in exercises by maybe with the counterfactual kind of things, um, creating different possible scenarios under right. which you would, you would do this. Right. So, in other words, each text produced is a possible world. Yes. It's a possible world produced under certain types of constraints. And so, 
in your mind then would part of the task of the translator would be not just identifying uh, or just not producing the target text as a possible world, but also identifying those constraints which produced it. Would, you'd have that self-reflexive activity then with, let's say, the education where you try to teach that? Yes. So I think the, the awareness of the historicity of the process needs to be at both levels mm -hmm. so, or, or at both on both parts of this process so students need to be aware that the text that they work with is historically conditioned under certain constraints yes but the one that they're going to produce is equally historically conditioned um, for instance i mean it may be very obvious but some people would argue in translation studies that you cannot have equivalence. Right. Now, we know that absolute equivalence is impossible, but right. that does not mean that if you translate the constitution of a country, mm -hmm. you cannot render something that the president will stamp and say, this is the constitution and it will hold up in law, even mm -hmm. if it has been translated. Mm -hmm. So, although, so, so the, what I'm trying to say is that sometimes the relativity in the process is covered for, if you want to call it that, mm -hmm. by, the, by the power in the social situation, which, right. which can, I mean, legal translation, pharmaceutical translation, um, all these kinds of things. You, you, but then you also have literary translation, which can be as free as the Count of Monte Cristo example that I, that I used. So what I'm trying to say is that the, the semiotic process in itself don't have these constraints the conditions, the historical conditions under which you operate impose these constraints. And that means that sometimes a text can for all practical purposes be called an equivalent. Right. Of course, in, in law, it acts as the original. Right, right. Um, but it, that doesn't mean that I'm claiming that linguistically speaking, it's an equivalent. Right. Legally speaking, it's an equivalent. And, and we need to have those those sets of constraints in our, in our minds, I think, to, to understand how complex these translation processes are. Right. And so, I, I, in listening to you uh, play this out and reading your other work, um, that one of your contributions to understanding semiosis would be to take this process of creating meaning and really put it within the context of constraints and, and, and possible worlds in a lot of ways. And so, one of the things I think you're doing in your work is bringing uh, narration and possible worlds considerations together with a body of work in complexity and translation, uh, which is in itself a very complex kind of thing, as you could imagine. Moving along to a more specific question, uh, and we'll talk more about future uh, uh, tactics in a minute. Um, let's talk about context now. We're talking about radical context. Uh, we're at NYU, and uh, I have a lot of associations in my mind when I think of NYU, you know, the fabulous philosophy department that's here, the wonderful work that's done in the social sciences and neurosciences and the like. But I also think about some of the work that's done here in comparative literature. And I'm particularly thinking of the work of Emily Apter. Uh, now, uh, some of you, probably, there might be some Emily Apter friends or students in this uh, room. You're remaining mute. That's good. Uh, that um, she rather famously uh, calls into question the system of, of world literature. And she invokes this idea of untranslatability. Uh, and there are certain quarters, particularly people like Barbara Kasim, who's done that wonderful dictionary of untranslatables, uh, an amazing uh, intellectual achievement. Uh, but certainly, you know, there is a kind of challenge, it seems to me, to the kind of thing that you're proposing here. Uh, how would you answer? you know, the kind of challenges that people would make about world literature and uh, untranslatability in the way that uh, Apter and Kasim would uh, probably make if they were sitting here in this room? Um, well, I, once again, am not able to answer that question from the world literature perspective, mm -hmm. because um, I know virtually nothing about world literature. Um, Does anybody? I know. <laughs> <laughs> right. But... I would, I would like to answer, so, so I would sort of being able to focus a bit on the, on the issue of, of untranslatability. So in terms of the definition that 
I've provided for translation as the meaning of a sign is its translation into another system of signs. Mm -hmm. That means that there is no untranslatability, that all meaning processes are translation processes. Mm -hmm. So untranslatability as a value or as a judgment mm -hmm. as to some possibilities, um, in that conceptualization does not arise. Mm -hmm. It's basically a, a misnomer in, in, in that um, um, concept in, in that conceptualization. So that would be the first um, if, 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 you, if you start off from the idea that all meaning is basically already an effect of a translation process and mm -hmm. has already been created translated from other right. streams, mm -hmm. then um, I think untranslatability becomes a, sort of a misnomer. The second thing I would say is that just empirical experience says that we do translate. Mm -hmm. um, and has always since the beginning of time and most probably um, will always. The only, for, m for, for my understanding, the only point where you can come to questions of untranslatability is if you, before you translate, have a prescriptive definition of what the translation should be. Mm -hmm. Then you measure translations against that prescriptive nature, mm -hmm. pre against your prescript prescriptive um, definition, and then say, well, I translate, I, I assumed, um, Echo does this, I, I say a translation um, has to be this mm -hmm. and therefore that is not a translation mm -hmm. or that is an adaptation or mm -hmm. that is untranslatable mm -hmm. right if you step away from that then I think anything is basically translatable because let's say there's a term that I know nothing about mm -hmm. somebody knows about it mm -hmm. so somebody has this me this this meaning so somebody can then by continuous meaning forms, by this process of translation, relate in some way to me some understanding of that thing. I'm not saying full equivalence. I'm not saying full identity. Mm -hmm. Because nobody says that, I think. Mm -hmm. But if that is what you're looking for, sure, then most things are untranslatable. Mm -hmm. But if you say that trans meaning, meaning is never set. Meaning is always process towards next process mm -hmm. and therefore it is the, the underlying principle is translation mm -hmm. um, and, and, and it's only you, you only sort of you sort of have to have a platonic view of meaning as an ideal set somewhere in a text right to be able to say it's not translatable but if it's historical process right. I think it must be it follows logically that it's translatable right uh, and so you would you know agree that with Wittgenstein, the later Wittgenstein, that uh, you know, meaning is understanding a, a form of life. That yeah. whatever form of life means, you know, that's yeah. itself is you know, it, you know, kind of open to contest. You know, it could be culture. Who knows what it could possibly mean? Now, what you just said leads to my next question, uh, and I'm I'm going to read this one so I don't get it wrong. Um, you have stated in your work that a goal of translation is the creation of interpretants, and you were just kind of making an allusion to this. Um, can you talk a little bit more about that? Um, and what I'm also interested in, and you're going to hear from me later about machine translation. I'm a computer scientist. Please forgive me. Uh, don't hold it against me. Um, what does this bode for machine translation in your mind? Um, well, first, the interpretant question comes from, yeah. from, from Peirce. So Peirce says that meaning is the creation of relationships between the what he calls representament, which is what we would call the sign, or you call it, he also calls it the sign vehicle. Mm -hmm. In other words, the word that I write on the page, that mm -hmm. would be the sign vehicle, the, the, the representament. Mm -hmm. And that has to be related to the object um, in which, in person's words, which determines the, the representament or which has an influence on the representament. Now, that object could be either something in reality or it could be an idea already has 
yes, I don't want to go into too much detail. But so once those two things are related, you get what he calls an interpretant. And that would basically be the meaning of the sign and the, the thing to which it refers. Mm -hmm. right? So that would be, and, and what meaning is becomes another whole philosophical question, but in Peirce's terms would be everything that you can understand from that and everything that you can act on that. So he's a pragmatist. He, he, he would say that the meaning of, his, of, a, of, a, of a text is the actions that I can take once I've interpreted mm -hmm. this sort of a, a conceptualization. So in that sense, the, the, the process of making meaning is the process of continuously moving by creating relationships between signs and objects mm -hmm. to creating meanings. And that meaning becomes the sign for another set of meanings, mm -hmm. which becomes, again, the sign for another set of meanings. So let's say I um, write the word dog mm -hmm. and I show it to you mm -hmm. and you perceive the word dog yeah. and you think about dog and the interpretant would be your dog at home. Mm -hmm. And you would say to me, yes, I've got a Labrador. Mm -hmm. So Labrador or yes, that your response is then from the initial sign, which was the word dog, becomes a more developed sign. Mm -hmm. Yes, I have a Labrador at home, mm -hmm. which I then take as a sign and say, think about my dog. Yes, and I have a German Shepherd, mm -hmm. which leads to somebody else saying, um, do you know this joke about dogs? Mm -hmm. right. So the, the interpretants, in other words, the meanings, become signs for the following process. And, and that's why I had incipient and subsequent systems because it's a continuous flow in time mm -hmm. the, the 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 meaning and we materialize it in different ways so you you give it semi-permanence by materializing it mm -hmm. as in a in written form or words or in your memory in your brain mm -hmm. um, but it's it's part of continuous process like a metabolism mm -hmm. right so in that sense for me translation is the creation of the process by which you create interpreters. Now, I cannot see why um, it would not be possible for computers, not being a computer scientist myself, I cannot see theoretically, I cannot see why computers would not be able to render interpreters. I think they would be. I'm glad to hear that. Right? <laughs> what we might talk about, and here, quality comes in. Right. <laughs> right. it, yeah. And the complexity of brain, and that Maria can talk about, and the ability that computers are able computationally to model that complexity, mm -hmm. that's, that, that's a debate. And there I can't help you. I mean, I'm... No, no, no. I, of <laughs> yes. course, I, I, just, I just want to get your gut reaction, yes, that's but, all. But no, I mean, the, 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 the computer as a tool of the, as an extension of the human mind, uh, human brain, right. can can create interpretants, and he right. does it. I mean, Google Translate is, is one example. Yes. And um, I mean, taking all kinds of data and turning it into graphs. It's, I mean, Peirce wrote a lot about graphs as indexical trans as signs and translations. So um, computers, I think, do lots of interpretants, can right. create lots of interpretants. Okay, that'll be a topic we'll take up in uh, <laughs> yeah. subsequent years. <laughs> Okay, we're running out of time. That's a constraint. And I keep thinking of Gravity's Rainbow by Thomas Pynchon. So the trajectory needs to go down again. Okay, so we started off with your background. And so what I'd like to do is talk a little bit about the future. Uh, can you say something particularly concretely? I think the folks here would be very interested in some of the things that you're doing in Africa. Uh, and maybe, you know, again, in your concrete historical contextual situation, uh, how this is playing out in certain types of research projects you're doing uh, in Africa these days? Um, yes, so what I, what I have done to a small extent and what I plan to do next year, I'm planning a sabbatical for the second half of next year, is to do empirical work on 
um, various aspects of development work in our context. Um, most probably I will use South Africa mostly, but I might also use other Southern African um, contexts. And I'm looking at things like um, a variety of, of sets of data. So one would be to take a, a development project. So you would have development um, agencies that come into South Africa or Zimbabwe or wherever and run projects, let's say farming projects or educational projects or uh, medical, medical um, projects um, and so on. And they have to make use of translators to communicate mm -hmm. and interpreters to communicate with the, with, the, um, with the population that they are working with. So that would be one, I would like to trace the, 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 the social process, as it were, in which translators and interpreters are used and how that constrains the implementation of the, the, mm -hmm. the, 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 the program or mm -hmm. the, the development, um, yes, the, the program. So that would be one thing that I'm trying to do. Other um, things would, would, would be to look at um, the emergence of social phenomena um, where language does not necessarily play a role. Mm -hmm. Um, let's say architecture and I'm, I have to be careful. I mean, obviously language plays a role everywhere in our lives, mm -hmm. but there, I think there are translations that take place semiotically between, let's say, um, seeing a particular sculpture mm -hmm. and then designing a building on the basis of that sculpture, mm -hmm. which Okay, in the mental process, language obviously may have played a role, mm -hmm. but they might also be pers also have iconic and indexical signs, which, which operate without language necessarily, mm -hmm. which is sort of just the res resemblance and the, the, the pointing um, function of a sign. So I'm really interested to see if I can somehow trace, let's say how um, new buildings on our campus mm -hmm. relate to, to what, what are the sources and to what kind of sources and where do we tend to seek our sources? I've already written an article with a bit of that, but um, I want to go more into that. And then I would also like to go into something like agricultural practices and maybe look at, a, at, a, um, at agricultural practices as meaning-making systems. And people would plow in this way for which reasons and to understand the reasons and then to understand if developers then come with new ideas, how do these ideas get translated and the value systems get translated into one another? And what are the clashes, obviously, of semiotic systems that arise out of these? Um, out of these? And having a bit of a religious previous background, I would also like to look at some of these in church um, church phenomena, mm -hmm. um, because churches in South Africa, I think, are sort of growth points of social emergence. And I think that would give you some really interesting data. So that would sort of be future things that I'm looking at. Um, I would like to finish the book that I'm working on now, sort of by the middle of next year, and that's sort of a very theoretical, boring, <laughs> for some people, part for me, it's exciting. But, um, and then go into a lot of get as much data as I can because I've, I've worked with limited data. One last question. We're going to pass it out to you. And this involves you. If, let's say somebody got really fired up with this in this group, and I hope you are, uh, what would you suggest as problems for people to tackle initially? Any particular well, problems initially. you would see? You know, if somebody um, wants to go out and further yeah. the Murray program of complexity. <laughs> um, I'm not sure that you want to tackle that initially, but a major thing that we still need to work on is methodology. I think we need people to help us, and especially if you come from um, with a background maybe in, in, in social sciences or, or even computer cognitive sciences and mm -hmm. so on, to help work on 
qualitative methodologies. I, I think we just scratched the, 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 the surface there. Um, I think also um, what you want to maybe look at, and, and that would be projects that you can do at, at master's level, I think, would be to see if you can, if you can relate semiotic patterns or social patterns to particular constraints. And you don't need to link them to all the constraints. But if you can say, well, um, this translation, let's talk interlingual translation, this interlingual translation took place under constraints X, Y, and Z. And I can do a thorough study and, and say at least with some degree of probability, we can, we can link that. Um, that, that I think we, we started to delve into um, trying to, to link these things without just assuming. Mm -hmm. I'm a bit of a Laturian, um, Bruno Latour, mm -hmm. um, actor network theory background of, and, and, and he's a bit skeptical of assuming the social. He wouldn't say that there's no such thing as the social, mm -hmm. but he says the problem is we assume it and it needs to be proven. So I think this is, this is um, what we can do is we can prove the, the impact of translation mm -hmm. rather than assume it and just write it up. Mm -hmm. So studies that, that, that sort of questions this um, uh, um, and you can, you, can, you can use relatively simple narrative and, and possible world's counterfactual mm -hmm. theories to, to work out some of these um, possibilities, I think. Excellent.